Good morning. Happy Sabbath. I want to thank um, Beth and Marjorie, Bonzella, Lindsay, Susan and Sarah, and Ann, Mayali, Janice, and Marina for their part on the program this morning. Uh, I'm sure y'all all realize that uh, no church service can be run by one person. We all need each other. I'm going to use this bike wheel as an illustration. Um, you notice that the, the, the spokes are very wide apart up here. This middle part represents God. And up here it's wide, but, and this represents us. The spokes rec rec represent us. You notice that the closer that they get to God the closer they get to each other. The spokes are very close to each other down here. Try to remember that illustration um, that w the closer we come in contact when we uh, develop a relationship with God, the closer that we're going to be to each other and we're going to become as one. One day, two friends began to argue as they walked through the desert. The dispute became so intense that one of them slapped the other one in the face. Without saying a word, the one who had been slapped bent over and wrote in the sand, Today, my best friend slapped my face. Continuing their journey, they came to an oasis and bathed in the water. Unfortunately, the one who had been slapped sank in the miry bottom and began to drown. But his friend rescued him. After he had rested a bit, the one who nearly drowned found a flat surface on the sandstone cliff near the oasis where he had carved the words. Today, my best friend saved my life. His friend said, After I hurt you, you wrote in the sand. But when I saved your life, you carved on a stone. Why? He replied, When someone hurts us, we should write the injury in sand so that the winds of forgiveness can blow away the memory. But when someone blesses us, we must engrave the stone, the record in stone, so that no wind can ever erase it. Let us bow our heads. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your love and your watch care over each one of us. And I want to invite the Holy Spirit into each one of our hearts as we open your word. Um, hide me behind the cross. And may the words spoken will be your words. And I want to thank you, Jesus, for praying for us when you were here on this earth, that we would be one. And just help us to draw closer to you so that we can be in unity as you're coming, uh, as, you, as we watch for your soon coming. And we ask this in your name. Amen. Um. We're going to talk about principles for better relationships. Okay. It says, our Lord's will for us that, that we be one so that the world will believe in him. And, you know, Jesus prayed for us. That was in our... Um, scripture reading that all of us may be one and may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me so there's two primary reasons that Jesus came to this earth number one 
to reconcile us to the Father by his perfect life and death. And you can read that in Romans 3 and 2 Corinthians 5, 7 to 21. Number two, to reconcile us to each other in perfect agape love relationships. In other words, restore us to the image of God. Let's turn to John 17, uh, 21 to 23. We're going to read that. And part of this is part of the scripture reading. Uh, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also may be sanctified by the truth. <clears throat> I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory or the fellowship which you gave me, I have given them that they may be one just as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Amen. So to re reconcile us to each other in Acts of the Apostles, we find, uh, page 549, it's not the opposition of the world that most endangers the church of Christ. It is the evil cherished in the hearts of believers. On the other hand, the strongest witness that God has sent his son into the world is the existence of harmony and union among men of varied dispositions who form his church. Number two, uh, respect and di respect the diversity of temperaments and God created differences in people. We're all made different. We've got all, uh, we should all be able to live together. The Lord has created and gifted each of us differently. So the body of Christ will have all its complementary parts sacredly regard the feelings and respect the rights of those with whom God has placed us in relationship. In um, Child Guidance, page 205, we read, March diversities of disposition and character frequently exist in the same family, for it is in the order of God that persons of varied temperament should associate together. When this is the case, each member of the household should sacredly regard the feelings and respect the right of the, of the others. By this means, mutual consideration and forbearance will be cultivated, prejudices will be softened, and rough points of character smoothed. Harmony may be secured, and the blending of the varied temperaments may be a benefit to each other. Um, and the same thing is in the church family. All of this can apply to the church family when um, we, we, we all have different personalities, but that doesn't mean we cannot get along. Assume the best about others, motives and actions. Listen more Seek first to understand clearly and then to be understood. Don't take things secondhand from secondary sources. Acts of the Apostles, page 319, we read, Christ-like love places the most favorable construction on the motives and acts of others. It does not needlessly expose their faults. It does not, not listen eagerly to unfavorable reports, but seeks rather to bring to mind the good qualities of others. Follow, follow Christ's specific instructions 
and do not talk to others about problems. Number, say, only say those things which can be helpful for building others up according to their needs. Let's turn to Ephesians 4, uh, 29 to 32. Ephesians 4, 29 to 32. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Even if something is true, don't talk to others if it can't help or resolve the problem. And of course, we are instructed in Matthew 18, 15 to 17, it's a called the gospel order in how to deal with situations when somebody may hurt you. Um, go to the person alone first, and then if you need to, take two or three uh, others with you as witnesses. And but lastly, if needed, take it to the church for discipline. Let's turn to Matthew 5, 23 to 24. Matthew 5, 23 and 24. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. So if someone has ought against you, go before you come to church, before you uh, come to worship and seek to be reconciled. And lastly, never talk to those who are not part, <clears throat> excuse me, of the situation or solution process. <clears throat> Next, yield our rights and uh, expectations to God. Jesus did not go around defending his rights or getting angry when his expectations weren't met. Many of our relationship problems are caused by our concerns for our rights. Let's go to uh, uh, Psalms 119, 165. Psalms 119, 165. Great peace have those who love your law, and nothing causes them to stumble. Or, great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. There is a time for tough love, but be sure it's the Lord's will, and not a self-centeredness. Next, praise God for the source of irritations. In other words, if somebody irritates you, praise God for it. Make a list of the good things about the other person and praise God for those things. Pray for the problem person to be blessed. Praise drives evil angels away. We're told in Review and Herald, um, August 5, 1890, when things go crossways at your homes or at church, strike up a song about the matchless charms of the Son of God and I tell you, when you touch this strain, Satan will leave you. And then by beholding, we become changed. So dwell on the good of others. Okay. Lay aside pride and selfishness. 
Five minutes can solve most difficulties if self and pride are laid aside. In um, early writings, 119, 120, we read, I saw that the remnant were not prepared for what is coming upon the earth. Stupidity like lethar lethargy seemed to hang upon the minds of most of those who profess to believe that we are having the last message. My accompanying angel cried out with awful solemnity, get ready, get ready, for the fierce anger of the Lord is soon to come. His wrath is to be poured out, unmixed with mercy, and ye are not ready. Rend the heart and not the garment. A great work must be done for the remnant. Many of, their of them are dwelling upon little trials. Said the angel, legions of evil angels are around you and are trying to press in their awful darkness that ye may be ensnared and taken. Ye suffer your minds to be diverted too readily from the work of preparation and the all important truths for these last days. And ye dwell upon little trials and go into minute particulars of little difficulties to explain them to the satisfaction of this one or that. Conversation has been protracted for hours between the parties concerned, and not only has their time been wasted, but the servants of God are held to listen to them when the hearts of both parties are unsubdued by grace. If pride and selfishness were laid aside, five minutes would remove most difficulties. Angels have been grieved and God displeased by the hours which have been spent in justifying self. I saw that God will not bow down and listen to long justifications, and he does not want his servants to do so, and thus precious time be wasted that should be spent in showing transgressors the error of their ways and pulling souls out of the fire. Daily and moment by moment, Um, in infilling of the Lord himself is the only way we can truly love others. Lord, do you require more of men than what I am doing? I'm busy in your work, yet I am not certain that it is what you have for me to do. Lord, what more can I do to serve you? Nothing, my child. Uh, Nothing. But Lord, why do I feel discontented with my service for you? I'm giving of myself and my mo money unsparingly. I'm the church clerk and work with women's ministries. I give much of my time to witnessing for you. What more can I do for you? Nothing, my child. But Lord, there still remains a vacancy inside, in spite of my private and public devotions to you. What more can I do? Nothing. Listen, my child. Stop doing things for me. What? Now, Lord, let's be reasonable. You've blessed my work for you. You've exhorted me to labor in your vineyard. What do you mean? What if I do stop doing things for you? Then I'll be able to do them through you. Oh, I see. Of course, Lord. My work for you is in vain unless you do it through me. Make me a fit channel, Lord. Do humble, do humble me and may I be worthy, a worthy vessel for you to use. Now, what task do you have for me to do through me? None, my child. What? You said you'd work through me. What is your task for me? 
My daughter, love me. Now, wait a minute, Lord. I've been a Christian for years. And what do you mean, love, love you? I do love you. Okay, now that's settled. What's the next step? There is no other step, loved one. Just love me. You know I love you, Lord. My whole life is taken up with service to you. What do you mean? Your love for me is revealed in your love for your fellow man. Oh, oh, I know that, Lord. I do love my fellow men. Do you love your neighbor? Well, I don't hate her. <laughs> I just leave her alone, and she leaves me alone. Do you love your neighbor? Now look, we don't get along. Our personalities clash. One cannot solve that, so I avoid her. I died for her and live for her too. I know, Lord, and I would like to see her saved, but you understand that I, I just don't click with her. Do you love your neighbor? Oh, I respect her. And I think she re respects me. I recognize that she's a fine lady, and I'm sure she'd make a good Christian. But I guess I do think of her as being overconfident and conceited, even a bigot at times. You know her, kind Lord. Why all, why all of this about her, Lord? Look at the, all these other people I love. Why I could... My child, do you love your neighbor? She's the one person, Lord, that I can't stand. She's pretty hard to take, but I do love, I guess, everyone else. And certainly you know I love you. You love me only to the extent that you love the person you like the least. But, well then, I really don't care about you then. But I've been a Christian years. I've always thought I loved you. Now I see, Lord. Thank you for revealing this to me. I will truly love you now. You cannot, my child. But you said love me. And when I said okay, you... I don't understand. How can you love me? There is no love in you. God is love. Then I can't love anybody? You are the only channel through which I can love anyone. Then, lo then Lord, love this world through me. This world of broken men and women. Thou didst love through death, Lord. Oh, love through me again. My child, yes, I will. Amen. One night in a church service, a young woman felt the tug of God in her heart. She responded to God's call and accepted Jesus as her Lord and Savior. The young woman had a very rough past, including alcohol, drugs, and prostitution. But the change in her was evident. As time went on, she became a faithful member of the church. She eventually became involved in the ministry teaching young children. It was not very long before she caught um, the eye and heart of the pastor's son. The relationship grew and they began to make wedding plans. This is when the problems began. You see, about one half of the church did not think that a woman with a past such as hers was suitable for the pastor's son. The church began to argue and fight against the matter. So they decided to have a meeting. As the people made their arguments and tensions increase, the meeting was getting completely out of hand. 
the young woman became very upset about all the things being brought up about her past. As she began to cry, the pastor's son stood to speak. He could not bear the pain he was, it was causing his wife to be. He began to speak and his statement was this. My fiance's past is not what is on trial here. What you are questioning is the ability of the blood of Jesus to wash away sin. Today, you put the blood of Jesus on trial. So does it wash away sin or not? The whole church began to weep as they realized that they had been slandering the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Too often, even as Christians, we bring up the past and use it as a weapon against our brothers and sisters. Forgiveness is a very foundational part of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. If the blood of Jesus does not cleanse the other person completely, then it cannot cleanse us. If that is the case, then we are all in a lot of trouble. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. End of case. Uh, the, the closing hymn will be on the screen. And um, I want to remind uh, everyone that this evening at Vespers at 730, um, uh, Mary, Ann, Mary Ellen Weingardner, she's the pastor's wife for the King Church. Uh, she's going to be presenting on uh, how to uh, develop a prayer life. So I invite every one of you. It's not just for women. It's for everybody. And it will be meeting in the fellowship hall.